Hello, and thank you for joining our session. I'm Christina Cowden, and I lead the UiPath Academic Alliance Program across the Americas, and I'm excited to be the moderator for this session today. We have three RPA experts and UiPath most valuable professionals with us here today, Carlos Vega, Nicholas Erlichman, and Tracy Dixon. I wanted to start out by asking, could you each give us a short summary of your journey to RPA and your support efforts of education and RPA? Nicholas, let's start with you. Yes, hi. So I first started while working on Deloitte. It was a new technology that our team was trying to start working on. And we only had one person working on that for a few months off. So they invited me to join in the efforts. So I started working with a couple of managers and I found it like I really loved it. And one of my managers was really involved in education. So she, she teaches classes and courses in master's degrees and postgraduate degrees. So she started inviting me to teach specific classes on RPA. Um, from that, I got to teach classes in different institutions and universities, and always mostly because she invited me to join, and it's something that I've really enjoyed the past few years. Wow, what a great connection. Tracy, how about you? So for me, I'm always looking for what is going to be on the docket to learn next. So in late 2018, um, our, our company had started a, an RPA practice and I had to ask what is this crazy robotic stuff that you're talking about um, and it it turns out when I dug into that a little further um, learned that the training was all free the tooling was free um, and it fulfilled a, a need I'd been looking for for years um, seen all the macro recorder tools none of them worked well none of them would even work a second time when I tried again but it actually resolve some of the issues I was having with that, that I could make something um, that could make me more productive and it actually worked um, multiple times. So I was super excited um, and started going through all the, the courses then at that time. And it was not long thereafter that I was working on an automation for myself and then not too long thereafter working on automations for clients. Wow, that's great. And how about you, Carlos? Well, back in 2017, my company uh, started doing a POC with RPA, with UiPath. So they brought a consulting company and they implemented the version uh, back in the day. And at some point, that consulting company had to leave and they needed someone to kind of, hey, someone needs to chat and feed for this platform. And I was doing a lot of the infrastructure automation. That's my, my background. Uh, and then it's OK, now you, you, you take a look from the process automation perspective as well. And that's how I kind of got uh, in contact with YPath, and I quickly learned that the potential that we have with YPath was just so much bigger than anything else we're doing in the automation realm, uh, and, and started thinking, hey, we need to create a COE, we need to, to grow, the, uh, grow the adoption across the company, so we start training our users and whatnot. In parallel to that, uh, back when I was living in Brazil, I was a college teacher for maybe seven, eight years, uh, so I've been, been trying to also reconnect with some of my fellow uh, teachers to say, hey, there's this new technology that is super powerful and you can get a lot of benefit from bringing that to the classroom uh, and really expands across only outside IT, which is where I came from. Let's say, hey, if you're working in HR, in finance, in any area, you can use RPA to really expand what you can achieve. And, and that's how a little bit I, I kind of bridged both my corporate experience with also kind of bringing students and trying to inspire folks to see the, the potential that I saw uh, into RPA. Wow, all three of you have pretty organic approaches <laughs> to finding RPA. Um, and then we definitely love that you give back by being an MVP and working with educational organizations. So one of the things that I wanna ask you all now is how did you find and foster the connection with educational organizations or students that you're working with? So Tracy, I'll start out with you for this one. So with me, whenever um, there's a, a call for career day, I've learned if you put robot in the name of, of what you're um, affiliated with, they, they never pass you up. So <laughs> I've uh, talked a few times at, at my children's schools for sure and some others about um, what in the world RPA is and, and how people can get further into that. Um, and then there are some local programs um, that are affiliated with the, the public university here. Um, where I've been invited um, from, from some other um, speaking opportunities. People heard me talk there and said, hey, we'd love you to, to talk further with our students. 
um, been able to, to speak with them, help them with their, their resumes, um, help them with bugs when they really hit the wall um, just as a mentor. Um, so had several different opportunities and it, it, I really can't pass up somebody um, getting stuck with something and asking for help. And then um, and working currently on trying to build a more a permanent, I guess, connection um, where the, that university that those students are from takes advantage of all of the UiPath resources on an ongoing basis, um, even to the point that they're um, talking with us about implementing a, a RPA focused course, or at least a choice for RPA in their curriculum for computer science students. Wow, that's really amazing <laughs> how involved you are. And Carlos, you had mentioned that you've been an educator yourself before. So how did you then foster that connection? And now that you're supporting those students in Brazil and anywhere else? <laughs> Yeah, so I think once you start teaching, it, it, it's like a, uh, something that you always will be doing, right? It might, might change the context. It might not be on a classroom, on a formal uh, teaching environment, but I, I think the passion to, uh, uh, I think the passion to teach is really the passion to learn. It, it kind of goes the other way around, right? Because when you, you interact with others, you're actually learning from their experiences. They're asking you questions that you might not know, and that will just drive you to try to learn more and, and be able to help them. Uh, so I think fostering those connections is something that uh, I had in me since I was a student, and then just keeping the contact uh, across several paths. Uh, and, and I think a little bit of my journey also helped that, right? So what, what Tracy just mentioned, you, you, you bring the word robot, everyone got super excited about. And then when say, hey, now we're working in a different country, and, and how can you share a little bit of how did you got to that, to that point and what you've learned and, and how can others uh, maybe learn a little bit from there and also uh, challenge me with some, some, some questions that I never thought about. And I think you just become, again, the organic growth on uh, keeping those connections alive and being able to help others at the same time that you're growing with it is where I see a lot of, uh, a lot of fun. And, and that's what I, I try to keep, keep doing and keep engaged. That's great that being an educator, you're learning a lot as well. And Nicholas, you've done so many different educational things from being a professor to helping educate people across the community. So how do you, from that point of view, how do you tell people to find or foster these connections that you have within the different organizations? Well, I think that the most important thing is being passionate about it because as Tracy and Carlos said, this is a topic that everyone is eager to learn. Again, you hear robots and everyone follows crazy, but RPA is a topic that even though it's been for a while, I think for the past maybe three to four years, it's been getting a lot more traction. People is getting really interested in learning. And um, there's a lot of people interested in getting the technology to others, like, again, MVPs like SAS. So I think the most important part is just putting yourself out there and trying to reach to the people that are attending your classes or your workshops or, I don't know, even your project meetings um, along your work. For example, all my connections that allow me to get to institutions, um, universities, I've made them through my work, like previous managers or, I don't know, institution contacted me because they I was recommended by a client I worked in the past. So I think mm, that is the most important part. Like you like the technology, you like teaching or getting the information out to others. And that shows when you teach classes. That's amazing. So then as a follow-up question to all of you is what is the biggest challenge you faced when introducing this technology to students or what advice would you give to individuals looking to give back and educate their community on RPA? Mainly all of you are RPA experts and all of you are extremely involved in your communities. So I'm sure that we'd love to know what you would recommend in those areas and then kind of the pitfalls that you've seen. So Nicholas, I'll start again with you. Yeah, so I've been teaching mostly non-technical people, so mostly business users and those kind of things. So I think that the most, the hardest part right now and uh, has been getting to understand the technology part behind the RPA part. Um, it's been getting easier along the years because the tool has been getting easier to use and easier to understand, like with help of Studio X, for example. But I think that's the hardest part. And the other part is keeping people engaged. Like I've seen at least with community programs, not mostly with educational programs because they attend to a course, to a class, so they keep on. But with community, the problem is keeping the community engaged. Like 
you may teach a course to 25 students, but since we're doing mostly everything remote nowadays, keeping everyone present, asking questions, or even answering questions, it's really hard. Mostly people are not seeing the background with their cameras off, so it's hard to have a feeling on how they're doing if you're not able to see them. So I think the remote part, at least for, for me, has been the hardest part right now. Yeah, that's definitely understandable. Tracy, did you have similar problems when you started up or keeping people engaged? So for me, I think the hardest part, especially when talking to, to groups, to, to schools where you're um, trying to, to make a, the curriculum available, is that they, they don't believe it's really free. But they don't believe that, uh, they think there's some gotcha at the end. You talk about it, you talk about the platform, about how popular it is, how, how you know, far it can get people in their careers. And they're waiting for, you know, the premium to kick in or, or something like that, where it, I do sometimes um, have people that go, to, no thanks, and learn that it's because it's almost too good to be true, you know, that it fills a, a lot of check boxes for them, but they just don't believe that there's not going to be a charge at some point. Um, so that that's probably been one of the, the toughest things. Um, and then to, just in general, but students can be very busy if you're pursuing things that, you know, it can be sometimes hard to, to make time. Um, so I, I try to get people doing something that helps them personally um, early on where they can see the benefit. They're saving themselves a little bit of time that way and then not have time to, to learn more and automate more in the future. Yeah, that's really good advice to get somebody to apply the skills to themselves and make it really personal. Carlos, did you have any challenges when introducing this technology or any advice that you offer to people who want to start this in their community? Yeah, I think I can echo both both comments from, from Nico and Tracy around some of the challenges of getting that engagement and really as a solution, trying to make it, how, how does that help me and how can I can I leverage that on a day-to-day -day basis so that it, it, it helps drive and build that engagement. But also the myths about RPA a little bit, when you say robots, everyone gets super excited, but they think it's something physical, right? They think that is some Skynet kind of thing. And you, you kind of need to draw them back to reality and say, no, this is what it really is. And this is how you can use that on your day-to-day -day basis. This is why it matters to you. Because really, if you look at how the workforce is looking in the future, automation is essential. It's not more if I'm going to automate something, it's just a matter of when. And, and that is, is growing a lot. So trying to draw those connections early on is a challenge, but I think it, it rewards you with that engagement that you need by the end uh, with all the challenges that we have with uh, being remote and, and, and really working through different technologies to make that all happen. That's great, thanks for sharing. And so what skills would you expect the students to go through or to have um, and be able to use and apply at the end? And so I'll come back and start with you because it seems like oh, along with the technology and the Zoom that we're all kind of dealing with over the past few years, those are in addition to maybe RPA development skills or understanding what the jobs are like. Yeah, I think the, the, the biggest skill that I'm, I, I really try to find and instigate is really the curiosity. Um, there are a lot that's happening in the technology space that really made it way more accessible in a way that hey, it's free, it's easy to learn. Uh, uh, the barrier to, to really get started in RPA now, it's, it's really low. Anyone can really get into developing an automation and using that on the day-to-day -day basis from any perspective that you get. So having folks curious about and seeing the value that that can, that can drive, I think is really the key to that. Yeah, that's really useful and insightful. Nicolás, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that, uh, as Carlo mentioned, the first or the most important thing is curiosity. Like, it doesn't matter how much we can teach them. If it's three to 10 to 20 classes, we are never going to be able to teach them everything about the platform. And again, even everything about all the products that UiPath has. So I think that what I like to get the most of the students is that they know what is out there like there are different products, what's basic things that you can do, and that you always need to know that there is a lot more to do than you already know. So like put yourself out there and continue learning because one comment that Tracy made was that you need to continue learning. It's like something that you continuously do and the experience is the most important part. Is that doesn't matter what you learn in a class or anything, the real experience is what gets you through. 
That's great. And Tracy, you had mentioned of what you want the students to be able to apply their knowledge for, but do you have any other skills that you would expect them to have? So I, I think along with curiosity, it's really tenacity The you know, I, I think students run into a, a problem early on and think like, oh, I'm the only one I, you know, nobody else is having this problem. And all of us, all of us have bugs, all of us hit the wall and have to walk away at the end of the day. And it's just about coming back the next day and keeping at it and using the resources that you have. You can throw questions out to the, the forum, you can throw questions out on Slack people will will come assist a lot of people have had the exact same thing um, so for all of us it's not about knowing all the things every day it's about using the resources and then being willing to go back to, to try to figure out the solution for something uh, because by no means are, are we all experts on the platform and every single product um, for sure so um, i'd love to get that across early on that it, you're you're going to have a problem at some point. We all do. It happens all the time. Just be willing to come back and continue working on it the next day. And so be curious, know the products available to you and know where to go, <laughs> which is definitely what I'm sure all three of you help a lot with in fostering in your community. So my last question is kind of more for fun. Have you had any project from students that surprised you or that were very cool that you've never seen RPA used in that way before? And Nicholas, I'll start with you. Well, that, that's a hard one, at least, like teaching clients, people, most of the projects do tend to be like things that you've seen before. But the, I don't think the stranger thing is you teach a three class course just to give the introduction into what RPA is and people end up building a bank reconciliation. It's like they start using things that will like, even if we've got to 10 classes, we wouldn't have be able to see or to teach them. So I think that the most crazy things is that like you teach just a small part and they end up building like huge projects because they get invested in the technology, into the tool and into what they can do. So they continue learning on their own to build a project that they need for the course. So I think that that's the most crazy thing that, that I've seen. Wow, that's great. And Carlos, do you have any projects that surprised you? I think I call it with Finico mentioned, a lot of the surprises are usually around uh, how much farther ahead they get by, by the end of a session or two. And, and well, the, the ideas that they're, that they're taking on see, hey, oh my gosh, I can use that in ways that we would never have thought about. Looking at uh, having automations that can make decisions around the color of something on a screen, that's something that you, you, you never thought about, but for a given, uh, a given process that might make a lot of sense, uh, things like that. I was like, wow, that is is really that's a little bit of how we learn from from teaching, right? Is just hearing a lot about some really cool, interesting ideas in environments that are completely different from from yours. My my, my background is strong in manufacturing, so when I hear something that folks are doing in a completely different environment, it's like, wow, that is that is really interesting. I think you get those gotchas a lot through teaching and through really. Uh, trying to answer some questions like, okay, what's behind that question? Tell me a little about the, the, the overall problem. And, and then I was like, okay, that is awesome. I never, I never heard about a process like that and, and how you, you're trying to figure that out. And it's, it's always something way more uh, advanced than you would expect in a short span of time, which I think is just an attestation on how easy it is to get involved with automation and how much you can achieve to it. Wow, that's great. So definitely the impact <laughs> is very surprising to everyone always when they first see it run. Um, and finally, Tracy, do you have any projects that surprised you or that the impact was really just a wow factor for the people who ran it? So I'm more surprised um, by students at the beginning thinking that I've heard uh, one say that there was no real career for RPA or it wasn't interested in, in going down that path. Um, so I love the opportunity to be able to correct that because I don't think a day goes by where I don't have someone trying to recruit me on LinkedIn. It, it is, you know, you even start thinking about studying RPA and it's where you get inundated um, because just people can't fill all of the positions in the field um, for sure. But kind of echoing what Nico and Carlos said, I am always amazed at how even students that are early in the process think differently than us think in their own way and show me approaches what, that I hadn't considered and, and want to incorporate into to what I do um, but I'm used to thinking you know big and that anything can happen in regards to, to automation so 
um, always excited to, to see what other people come up with. That's so great. I have one more quick question that's kind of a wild card for you all. Do you remember your first automation or the wow factor you had with your first RPA? So Tracy, I'll go back to you to see if you remember it. <laughs> I do. So the, the very first thing that I built for myself, which was totally maybe like a quarter of the way through the training you were supposed to do, it was just far enough like, ah, I'm going to go off road and do my own thing, see how far I get. Um, it was related to, to importing my phone records into my calendar as somebody who has to document what I do and, you know, a quarter hour here and half an hour here. It was so much better um, once I could regularly import all of that, because then I did not have to, to diligently write down what I was doing all the time, nor, um, you know, it, it was just always a nightmare. I forget to do it. But having that there to show who I spoke to and then had it um, reconciled with, with names, all, it was it was immensely better. It paved the way for my future timesheet automation where um, as long as I put calendars in, uh, calendar entries in, um, my robot fills out my timesheet for me was a lifesaver. I feel like my life is longer now because of that. So that, that was my first. I, I see how you want to tie it back to the students to make it impactful for them. Then. <laughs> and Carlos, do you remember your first automation or your first wow factor with RPA? Yeah, I think that the first project I had to work was around accounts reconciliation using a, a, a legacy application from, from Lotus Notes. Uh, it, it was, I remember because it traumatized me a little bit, working with, with legacy applications is always always a challenge, but it, it wouldn't be possible without RPA really. That was that was the, the cool takeaway. It, it was really uh, an interesting way of using technology uh, to deal with technical debt. And uh, it was a, a challenge at the time because I, I, I was really green in terms of learning. I was kind of learning and trying to, to figure out the challenge on itself. Uh, and as, as Tracy mentioned, really paved the way on, okay, now I know all the, uh, some of the, 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 the challenges and uh, try to figure out really uh, uh, innovative ways to, to think about problems that are not from the traditional uh, programming uh, mindset. Uh, so that that that's the, the first memory I have. That's great. You're solving challenges and seeing it run while other challenges are being proposed to you. So that's a little crazy. <laughs> and Nicolas, do you remember your first wow factor? Yes, well, it was actually, I think my, my second process, but the wow factor came probably six months after building the project. It wasn't something for insurance claims for car accidents. And when I first started, I learned by reading documentation and doing things in the platform. Didn't know Academy existed or anything. And after a while, I learned about Academy. I started studying, so I kind of improved myself. And when I got back to see my first process, the wow factor was there because it was horrible. Like, I've learned so much in just a few months. Then seeing that kind of work that I did, it was like, I was surprised at how much you can learn in just a few months if you put out there. And that's why I think tying to what we, when you ask it, what do we want people to learn from our classes? I think it's that, like, you are going to continue improving yourselves. And if you look back two, three, six months back, you're going to see how much improvements you have gotten. I think the wow factor for me, it continuously happened on that point. Wow, that's great. Thank you all so much for sharing. And thanks everyone for joining our session. And definitely a sincere thank you again to our speakers and our UiPath Most Valuable Professionals with us here today, Carlos Vega, Nicolas Ehrlichman, and Tracy Dixon. Please join us for our next session, and we'll see you later at the live networking tables.